This is part two of two of our symposium with Eric Myers. topic is astrology and spirituality. Could you speak to us about how they connect? If you are coming from the mindset that everything is spirit, then how couldn't they connect? It's uh, And so my view is that everything is ultimately spirit. Or it's all oneness. It's all interconnected. And astrology, in my understanding, is that our source energy, the sun, is what we're all revolving around, and it gives light and energy and, and sustenance. And then we are in the realm of separation and portrays all of the workings and of separation consciousness uh, and how we're reconciling that in order to realize greater oneness. So my, my view is very broad about what is spiritual, because what wouldn't be spiritual? I think some people have inherited the idea uh, someone might be, quote, more spiritual than somebody else, meaning that they might meditate or go to church or have certain experiences or something. But I think that we're emerging out of the mindset that some things are spiritual or some people are and some aren't. We're learning to all identify as part of oneness. Just the nature of that question shows that we aren't there yet. But ultimately, I think that's what we're awakening into. And so to me, astrology just shows kind of the intelligence of nature and how it's interacting with itself through us, how it's our broader container and how we live in this magnificently intelligent, you know, meaningful, co-creative relationship with these energies that surround us. Well, you mentioned some of the issues that this might present to people. How do they connect and the split there is now And could you speak a little about that and how you see that might be resolving or reconnecting? When you say the split, I'm not sure what you mean by that. The split between the material and the spiritual. Oh, okay, sure. Well, this really shows the movement of what we said earlier between basically identifying within only the Saturnian realm of material focus and separation, the Uranian which is more energetic understanding instead of material. And instead of separation, it's more unity consciousness. And so we're healing the mythic castration. Saturn in mythology, Kronos, castrates his father, Oranos, uh, indicative of separating the transpersonal from our more immediate experience in order to be more immediately concerned with separation and things on a more material level. What's the usefulness of this? Does it serve my aims? Is it good or bad? And so it's very useful to organize life in the Saturnian realm. There's nothing at all in any way, shape, or form wrong with any of this. It's completely necessary. But the reality that we're awakening to is that separation consciousness isn't the final authority on our existence, that there is another level. And so we are reconciling the split. We are healing this mythic castration. And so one of the lines that I play around with, I could be somewhat irreverent at times. Uh, I'm a Uranian. And so at the beginning of some of my lectures, when especially when I speak about Uranus, is I say to the crowd, who's ready for testicle reattachment surgery? Is, is what I ask. <laughs> is that we're really going to give the whole purpose of, of Uranians. And my work is to bring the transpersonal into more of our understanding uh, into the conventional paradigms, into the way that we can approach the world. But in order to do that, it is a very threatening and challenging prospect for some people to consider because the implications of this, many people are simply not ready for. To tell people 
that you're actually interacting with yourself through everything, that there's no objective universe. There's only your story, your own consciousness projection. You're pretty much living in a layer of a dream that you're co-creating. These are some things that some people might take issue with. That (laughs) sounds crazy. Wake up. You're mad. You know, Uranians are always marginalized for being mad and unwelcome. And so there's a castration. The larger point really is, are we ready for integrating the broader transpersonal truth? It takes a lot of maturity. And as you mentioned before, to get to Uranus, you have to do the high end of Saturn, which is maturity, which is accountability, which is responsibility for everything that you've co-created. And when we are able to do that, then we can move uh, towards the transpersonal. But to be honest, most people do not have that level of maturity. Most people are still arguing with reality. Most people are really just at war with things that they have exception with. They're not willing to see themselves in in everything. And so that's really the precipice of where we're at right now. So my view is that the 21st century is about moving uh, to complementing, not you know, leaving separation consciousness, of course, but to complementing the, the the transpersonal within or die blowing the whole thing up trying because people who refuse to do that might be in power. They might do something cataclysmic. You know, the whole ship might go down out of fear. And so that's the way I kind of see this 21st century. Are we going to break down or break through Saturn, just separation consciousness? So this whole chatter about the Mayan calendar ending and the shift in ages and many other different spiritual paths and wisdom traditions having some type of shift. That's what I think this century is pretty much about. Are we collectively going to make it to uh, Uranus or are we going to obliterate ourselves trying? Yeah, very, (laughs) very true. But I'm seeing more and more of this Uranian energy about. And so it leaves me very hopeful one of the words we're all using is transpersonal. Maybe it might be a good idea to explain what that means. Simply put, uh, trans means beyond. Uh, So beyond the personal. When we say the personal, think of the egoic strategizing within separation consciousness, where most people have the experience that they're in the center of their own experience. And then seeing the sun as the ego is a reflection of that. My, my issues around that. I don't believe each person is only at the center of their own experience. We're also involved with something broader than us that's beyond the personal. We're enveloped within this magnificent, interconnected, intelligent organization of energy. That's what astrology portrays. And um, so transpersonal is not looking at things in terms of what's good or bad for me or my own perspective. It's removed from that vantage point to just see things in a more non-attached way. And so the ego might look at, say, Saturn coming to Venus in someone's chart and say, oh, I'm going to have to go through difficulty in my relationship, or I might have challenges with my finances or many other uh, interpretations. So they might have the assumption that this this is an event that might be bad. Whereas at the transpersonal level, There is no judgments about how it might serve or not serve me for my own egoic, you know, interests. It's kind of like just looking things for what they are. The energy Saturn is teaching my Venus something. And if I'm not rooted in good or bad, I get excited about my curriculum. I'm eager to grow. And so it's beyond attachments. It's beyond judgments. So at the Uranian level, we we level all judgments. And the type of astrology I do, I don't bring in any good, bad language to my clients. I don't tell them that something's going to be good or bad or, or pleasant or unpleasant. I say, here's the curriculum. It's up to you to navigate it consciously or not. And if you don't navigate it consciously, then anything in astrology might not be very favorable for you. And so it's beyond judgments and stories and preferences to just abide with what is. There's been new asteroids and planets that have come into our consciousness as they've been seen in the heavens, so to speak. 
Do you think this has anything to do with our movement towards the transpersonal? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, even when I was a a child in the uh, 70s and 80s, and what I learned about the solar system is now so woefully outdated to what we now know, it's, it's, it's almost comical. And there's clearly this invitation to expand. And I remember for so long as a kid, like, oh, yeah, Pluto is the farthest known planet. And I wonder if there's this planet X or all this speculation, something further. Now we know so much more. There's so many. There's all of these Plutinos in the Kuiper belt beyond Mm -hmm. Pluto. There's thousands of them. And there's other types of um, more significant bodies like Sedna or Eris that are orbiting way, way further. In fact, here's something for you. Uh, Sedna orbits our sun. It's in a really irregular orbit that looks like almost like a trombone slide or like a paperclip. And so it comes really close to the uh, sun and then it goes way out there really far. And the statistics I love because Sedna reaches out a hundred times farther than Mm. Saturn. And Saturn is like the 1%, those who want to be in control and the authorities and the patriarchy. And then we have a planetoid or dwarf planet, whatever they call Sedna, you know, planet orbiting a hundred times further indicative of the 99% versus the 1% that are out there that are petitioning, but you know, we're still giving our power away collectively to Saturn. And so that portrays, you know, the kind of Occupy Wall Street and the Occupy movement that we do have something that goes a hundred times further than Saturn. And then, so there's many things out there and yes, it's all about the expansion of consciousness. Then we have something beyond the Kuiper belt called the Oort cloud, which has all of these smaller, tiny little bodies. And I I don't even know that much about it, obviously, but there's a ton of stuff out there. It's never ending. And so this living only within the Saturnian view in this day of age looks ridiculous and comical. I mean, it's, it's kind of like if you choose, if you live in a mansion and you choose to live in a bathroom and you don't ever leave the bathroom, that's basically what it looks like. And so astrology itself is still only governed by Saturnian value system and, and, and assumptions. And to me, it just seems amazingly limited. And I'm, I'm constantly surprised by the resistance to expanding beyond it. Well, like you described that orbit, like a paperclip, it's like it has to come in close to us and grab us and then pull us out way, way past the limits we've imposed upon ourselves. So it sounds well, that's fabulous. Just, well, that's just Sedna. I mean, um, orbit. I mean, uh, Eris is a much more regular orbit. And then there's all these other bodies that are beyond Pluto, Maki Maki and Hamea and, and Orca, and there's many others. I mean, they're still categorizing and organizing. I mean, there's hundreds of them. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, one of the continuing arguments I hear about astrology against astrology is the use of free will. Could you speak about how astrology works with free will? Uh, I used the term co-creative before, and that's really what it comes down to. It's it's no different than how you live your DNA attunement. You can make healthy lifestyle decisions. If you have a predisposition for cancer, well, you can do something about that. And studies have found that our lifestyle decisions activate certain genetic attunements and deactivate perhaps or modify how other things might manifest. And and I encourage people to look at astrology the same way. This is just your energetic attunement. You could do whatever you want with that energetic attunement. If you're, say, a female born in Kentucky, you could do anything you want with that. It doesn't mean that you're going to vote Republican and, you know, marry a guy and have a pickup truck. That's that's not the only possibility. 
You might have an alternative <laughs> lifestyle. You might do whatever you want. So I think that the mindset that certain things mean this means that is the way I phrase it is that astrology comes from uh, is an, an inheritance that this means that if you are a Leo, then it means this. And my view is that all of this is magnificently limited and contracted and there is infinite, unlimited potentials for the way that any person co-creates anything in their chart. You can do whatever you want. Nothing is fated. Everything is a co-creative relationship. Here's, here's one way to think about it is the relationship between free will and this broader structure. Think about time and space. You know, time has an element of uh, pr precision. It's going to be February 17th tomorrow, guaranteed. But space is our hand. We can navigate within February 17th any way we like. And we can do whatever we want. So, so time has more of that kind of quality of destiny. And space has more of the quality of freedom within that structure. And the same thing with, the, with astrology. The sun is going to be in Aquarius, making certain aspects tomorrow. Mars is in Pisces, etc. We have the Uranus-Pluto square and all the other things. That's guaranteed. But what we do with it is completely our design and option. Uh, it's, it's up to us. And we do have this co-creative relationship. But this has not been well understood historically. So the astrology that we've inherited isn't honoring the wide variety of different possibilities. Think about how life used to be a bit more regimented. There wasn't a lot of different choices, especially if you were born into certain situations and circumstances in certain countries. You had very few choices. And within this backdrop of very few choices – Astrology is going to manifest in a very predictable way. If someone is 29 years old and they're having the Saturn return, they're most likely going to be doing something at work in mainstream society and, and doing something very conventional at that one event that we all go through. And that pretty safe prediction. But now we have so much more f choices on our table. We are not bound by social norms and conditions of society. Not everyone gets married in their early 20s anymore, like my parents did and many people of their generation. And so we cannot look at any astrology event and say what will happen because the world has shifted. And so this is one of the remnants of the astrology that we've inherited that, in my view, really limits and gives astrology, I think, a very poor reputation of fortune telling because the world simply does not work that way. What we know for sure from quantum physics is that there's nothing is guaranteed. There's nothing written in stone. Everything is a tendency to exist. It's kind of like probability fields that get accessed by our consciousness. So I would never tell a client that you're going to access your own probability fields in this way and this is what will happen. That would be very narcissistic and I think inaccurate to say what will happen to anybody. I, I don't do that. And so there are times where I don't work with people because they want me to be a fortune teller. And I say, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> but that's, you know, the astrology that uh, we've inherited is much more within that mindset. Uh, it's before our understanding of quantum physics and the Uranian view of co-creative with energy. Saturn just sees everything as concrete. You got this going to happen. Saturn's going to hit your Venus and you're going to lose money. And that was, yeah. gener that was generally true hundreds of years ago. It's not true anymore. Wow. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eric. That's very helpful. Great. Eric, this is Lenny. You were talking about spiritual growth and a natural inclination to avoid difficult challenges and that many people prefer to keep things kind of easy going. What are some ways to use astrology to foster spiritual growth? In order to truly grow spiritually, in my view, you have to have that non-attachment 
meaning that you can't insist upon having only good experiences uh, in your life. And so that to me is the prerequisite. And most people uh, do not use astrology in that way. Most people do not approach life that way. Uh, most people want things to be more comfortable and easy and they want more money and ease in their relationships and a nice vacation. So it really is, is it important? That's the first question to have egoically friendly experiences or spiritually growthful types of experience. And so it's, it's actually in my understanding, not the highest percentage of people really, really truly want to grow spiritually. Most people when it comes down to it, actually would rather be comfortable. And so those people who actually do want to grow spiritually, then you can approach astrology with that mindset and you can see what the current um, curriculum is for you. And you can strategize to meet this curriculum in the most humble, open-minded way about your growth. And so let's say, for instance, Pluto is coming to your son or anybody's son, and that's going to be there for about three or four years within orb in my view. And so what's your attitude? How much are you willing to transform and to adapt and to face fears and to make it a priority to be a spiritual warrior, to even cultivate this, to do things that are consistent with the transit that are going to be um, available. So a lot of people might look at an event like that and say, okay, I might batten down my hatches and I'll get through it. Then it comes to them whether they like it or not because they still got to learn the lesson. So it doesn't really work. Or you can say, okay, I'm going to immerse myself in Plutonian things that are going to stretch my growth, that are going to be a challenge for me, that I can cooperate with this energy and just be open to what life is uh, – bringing me and, uh, and informing me of. And so, so intentionally going there. So this is what I counsel people to do. Say, okay, if they have a, a current event like that, I would say, yes, you're going to be uh, available to eliminate, to purge, to release a lot of, of um, unprocessed emotion. You know, Pluto is about elimination and transformation and uh, whatever you can do to facilitate that is to be encouraged and so go into your pain, go to therapy, do sacred medicine or whatever other processes that might facilitate this release and, and engage it. And, and then you surf the uh, energy, so to speak, and, and you grow from those experiences. But if you're not cooperating with it, like I said, it's going to bring – it's going to come to you anyway because energy always manifests. Something will always happen or many things that are consistent with that event. And so – you know, why not be more co-creative about it? So to answer your question, we can just look at the general archetypal thematic kind of um, curriculum that we're involved with and choose to partner with it in, in ways that uh, that are available around you and just and just honor what those what those lessons are uh, with your own kind of um, intentions and with the, with your own willingness to uh, learn those lessons. Well, um, so that would kind of be like looking for what karma I might have to resolve around my Pluto in Capricorn. And um, how can I do my best to release that karma and, and grow in consciousness? Would that be something that you would agree with? I might use the word karma a little bit differently. I would say that I, I, I like to use the word energy with the planets and say, um, well, here's the energy that is you're in dialogue with. And, and how are you going to dialogue with this energy in a productive way? Whereas karma is a little bit more of a, what, what I view is with the nodes of the moon uh, portray a lot of our karma, meaning the results of prior action. When a planet is uh, making an aspect, it's certainly connected to all of our facets and of our, of our consciousness and whatnot. But I, I would choose to see just the planets in general as, as more of this, this energetic dialogue. Now, of course, your historical use of that energy is going to be relevant and how you manage it now. 
but I wouldn't always say that every transit is meeting our karma. I would just look at it as planets or energy, like uh, like the four seasons. And you know, you're in the springtime or this cycle, uh, things are shedding. It's it's more kind of cyclical and, and energetic. Is is more of of my um, my my angle that I'm looking at it. Does that does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. I was thinking of my life purpose. What am I doing here and what's the best path for me? Yeah, and that's that's a bit of a different uh, angle. Than, you know, karma has a lot to do with resolution. And so the nodes of the moon, the moon's about the past and what's unresolved. The, the nodal axis has a lot to do with resolving karma. Whereas the uh, planets, in my view, is, yeah, like you're saying, how do we uh, partner uh, in order to work with these energies advantageously i mean so i i kind of view the uh, planetary energies as like different colors of the rainbow and uh, they're just different flavors of energy that have different archetypal meaning that compose us that we work with that we're kind of resonating at these frequencies and we form con- connections with others based on these frequencies so they're they're kind of like you know woven through the fabric of life these planetary energies. So we're totally in this co-creative relationship. And so when you understand astrology, you're like, okay, well, how could I co-create this? You know, I've got my son's in cancer and I know Jupiter is, is going to be in cancer hitting my son in July. So I know that is coming. So what can I do now to prepare to uh, build upon something and to get more outreach and expansiveness uh, in order to get more uh, impact in the world. And so the co- more conventional view is that something's going to happen to me, like Jupiter's like Santa Claus, who's going to give me a gift because I did something well. And that's when the gift is scheduled to get here is the old paradigm. And, and what I'm proposing and other people as well is saying, no, it isn't good or bad. It's just an opportunity for the natural energy of expansion and outreach and, and opportunities so you can have more impact. And, and claim your space in the world is what Jupiter is about. So it's an invitation. Now, certainly I could stay home and not send out any inquiries or or schedule anything and, and things aren't going to expand for me. But when you cooperate and you are able to see what the invitations are and act in accordance, then you're kind of surfing, so to speak, what the energetic currents are. And, and to me, that's just living in accordance with nature. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about how to discern your life goal or your life purpose? Oh, sure. Well, that, that enters yeah, much different uh, angles. Yeah, for life purpose issues, well, depends how you define that. If you're looking at it in terms of contributing to um, the evolution of society and what your purpose, then you're going to be looking at Jupiter, Saturn, Midheaven, Ninth House types of themes in the chart, uh, your purpose to contribute. If you're thinking about your purpose in terms of soul healing and and resolution of karma, then you're looking at the North Node as uh, balancing and resolving uh, the karmic habits or patterns, which is more or less the South Node. And then if you're looking at uh, things in terms of awakening, and to um, moving beyond the ego, my view of the sun has a lot to do with uh, more uh, awakened or enlightened consciousness that we could learn to experience and to identify in. So, and then there's other ways that you might be defining uh, purpose, but those are some of the initial things that come to my mind. Is there would some- you look at the placement of the of the planets in the sun, or would you look at the aspects of both? Everything. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's a complex system. Uh, but yeah, you're you're looking at everything really in in the uh, natal chart is going to be relevant in some way. And ultimately, we do have just one consciousness, not 10 different things. So ultimately, there is a holism to the chart. So understanding the chart more holistically is something that I try to encourage. Most of the time, Uh, People dissect things and looking at things within separation and they're focusing on this or that. But I I certainly encourage more more of a holistic uh, um, standpoint. And then the progressions and the transits would – how would you do that? 
Sure. Well, the transits are what we were talking about before, the opportunities for the energetic dialogues that are going on now and what the progressions are. The analogy I like is if you think of the astrology chart as like an acorn and the progressions is the development into the tree over linear time. So you can see your progressions for 2013 and I will show you how your uh, natal chart is progressing or evolving to be relevant today. And then the transits are like the weather that are uh, that's impacting the development of the tree to f- kind of complete that analogy. Um, so, yeah, I, I certainly um, use uh, transits and progressions as the as the two primary techniques when, when I work with people. Well, I like that. I really like the acorn thing. I think that's great. Thank you very much for that. Sure. Eric, what's ahead for astrology in the 21st century? And what do you see ahead for astrologers? What will be their roles? Yeah, well, those are two very different uh, questions. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I knew the uh, answer to number one, uh, what's ahead for astrology. I mean, the scene that we have right now is a bit chaotic. You have many, many, many different types of astrology out there. There's uh, tons of different directions. There's tons of different mindsets going into astrology. Uh, there's very little universal consensus in the way that it's approached and used and, and the techniques that are used. And so there is a very large buffet table that's available. And so I don't really see any of those major kind of choices on the buffet table removing themselves. Uh, they're all going to be there. So you're going to have Vedic astrology. You're going to have traditional astrology Uh, what's called Uranian astrology, evolutionary astrology, they're all going to be there. So astrology will flourish. Um, It will expand. More and more people are seeing that it's not silly and far-fetched, that it's actually valid. So astrology is set to grow. My major concern is the continuation of astrology evolving to actually incorporate and integrate what we now know about consciousness and about life and about spirituality, which in my view is woefully outdated. In the article that I'm writing for this book project I'm involved with uh, called Transpersonal Astrology, I I talk about how uh, the Copernican Revolution was in the 1500s, yet we haven't integrated that. The Scientific Revolution was in the 1600s, and yet we haven't really truly integrated that. Uranus was... uh, discovered in the 1700s. We haven't integrated a Uranian view. Neptune was was uh, discovered in the 1800s, and we haven't integrated the implications of a Neptunian vision of this universe, which is basically we're all dreaming. And then the 20th century was uh, the 1900s is where we discovered Pluto and, and had the quantum revolution, and we haven't integrated that into astrology yet. So I'm hoping and this is what I'm dedicating my life to, is that the 21st century can integrate these necessary discoveries and uh, adaptations from the last 500 years. It hasn't been integrated yet uh, into astrology. And so that's what I hope. And so whether or not that happens, you got me, but uh, <laughs> I'm, cer- I'm certainly going to dedicate my, my life to, to that goal. Uh, then what was part two of the question? Well, the other part is what's uh, ahead astrologically for the 21st century for everybody? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I love this question. Okay, so here's what I'm so excited about that goes along with my optimism for number one, is that if you look at the last four signs of the Zodiac, Sagittarius through Pisces, Um, Those are the ones that have most to do with collective, transpersonal, big picture issues and evolution away from egoic concerns, away from just purely social things, but more collective and transpersonal. And we have an enormous amount of emphasis on uh, these four signs. And right now we do have, you know, Pluto is – is uh, in the sign of Capricorn. It was just in Sagittarius. It's in Capricorn. It's going to move to Aquarius. Then it's going to be in Pisces. And that's going to be in Pisces till most of us are dead. 
uh, we're not going to see Pluto get into Aries. A lot of people listening to this right now. So just where the deepest, most transformative, that's Pluto, collective changes are within these more universal, uh, even transpersonal signs. Then you also have Neptune is in Pisces right now. And and here's where it also gets exciting, is that we have this Uranus-Pluto square. And roughly speaking, this is going to subside around 2019 or so. But then in 2020, we have a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius. And that is saying that we're going to be shifting our dominant institutions and structures, that's Jupiter-Saturn, into more of the new age, Aquarius, into more futuristic ideas and new paradigms. So all the work of the Uranus-Pluto square is then going to take root in culture and society uh, beginning in 2020. Then a couple years after that is when Pluto goes into Aquarius and technology and new paradigms and things that are Aquarian are just going to explode when Pluto gets into Aquarius that will be there for almost 20 years. And then before that's over, Uranus is then going to be in opposition with Pluto uh, in the early 2040s. And so without any break between now and 2050, it's the whole first half of the 21st century. And my research is the most kind of uh, revolutionary transpersonally oriented time frame that I, I have been able to discover. So it's not going to let up for the rest of pretty much uh, many of us, unless you're really young for the rest of our lives. And then there's going to be other stuff, you know, in the second half of the 21st century, but I don't even want to think about that at this point. It's so far away, but just fasten your seatbelts. Change is going to be constant and revolutionary and not let up. So I don't get too discouraged when uh, a lot of my ideas are are not being uh, discussed. I, I get the big picture. Things are, are going to be involved with paradigm shift and the transpersonal for decades. In your book, you write about the 21st century that it has to be deconstructed first and then reconstructed. Is that what you're saying, that we're going to be going through probably till uh, 2050? Well, yes. Everything that we've been talking about has that double-edged sword quality is that in order to build a new house, you need to demolish the old one, right? And so all the outer planets actually in different ways. Uranus is like the wrecking ball coming in. Uh, Neptune would be analogous to like a flood washing something away to the sea. And Pluto might be, gosh, you can have a lot of fun analogies uh, with Pluto. Uh, think about like a fire just boom, burning something down or, or a lot of termites coming in and gnawing the foundation away and it just collapses. Or you can come up with many other interesting analogies. But uh, all the outer planets do have a sense of destruction and then also stimulating the processes for rebirth. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Well, this has been wonderful, Eric. You've been so informative, and we very much appreciate your holistic thinking. Uh, that's absolutely refreshing, and also how you're integrating the new science into your thinking and your work. Mm -hmm. And uh, you sound like a very compassionate person who would uh, be very good in your consulting work. So we thank you on behalf of Sky Blue Symposia and we uh, hope our listeners will enjoy this as much as uh, we have. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much, Susan. And uh, this has been an honor to be invited. And I love talking um, about these issues and, and uh, you know, just any outlet that I can find. So thank you so much for reaching out and for valuing this work and this perspective. And I've had a lot of fun. Uh, this has been quite enjoyable. So if you want to have me back sometime down the road, I would I would certainly welcome that. So um, so much gratitude for you and, and the entire staff. Uh, thank you. We are providing our guests this opportunity for the listeners to find out more about him. 
Eric, would you like to uh, tell us about your website and your work and anything that you have going on right now? And you've mentioned your books, but you could mention them again as well. Thank you. The website is Soul Vision Consulting, uh, S-O-U-L, obviously, visionconsulting.com. I teach. I'm teaching a class, and I also have uh, private tutoring students that I work with. The main service that I offer is astrology consultations. I don't call them readings because, to me, that is the old paradigm of you go and someone can read your chart like they are approaching it from this really privileged perspective. Now, to me, it's uh, it's a consultation. It's more of a dialogue rather than a presentation. And I love working with people. It's probably my favorite thing uh, in life, I would say, is to uh, be an astrological counselor. I have my master's in counseling, and I've been a counselor for over 20 years. And I've worked with hundreds of people, and I love it. I mean, to me, it is so meaningful and intimate to have an open, non-judgmental, supportive conversation around the truly big picture issues. What am I doing here? What is my soul intentions? What is the karma that I'm resolving? What is my path to greater awakening? What am I contributing to the planet? What is my attunement to relationships or family or what have you? And uh, astrology from this approach, I have found to be so intimate and and meaningful that um, I really love it. To me, and maybe someday I'll, I'll just do it for free. I, I love uh, <laughs> doing consulting so much. It is so special to to join with people uh, at this uh, sacred level. And so mm. all the information about my um, consultations is on the website, information about my books, and then some articles. And then there is a store page and, and just a, con- you know, a calendar page that lists a few things that I'm up to. And I do have to update. I'm looking at it now. I, I don't spend a lot of time updating my website as I should. I do have a few events coming up. Um, I will be in uh, Raleigh in March speaking at uh, their astrology group there. I'm going to be in Cleveland in April and Chicago and Cincinnati doing different events. And then I'll be speaking in Asheville in May. And then over the summer, I also have a few events. I'm going out to California in June and then to uh, upstate New York in July and also Long Island. If people are in those areas and they would like to meet in person, then I do that when I'm on the road, time permitting. But I do most of my work on phone and this work does translate very well to phone. I record conversations with a little uh, gizmo that plugs into the phone line and then I email the recording after the session. So it is quite accessible. And then there's also Skype, which I do uh, work on as well. That's a bit about my website. That's great. That's wonderful. 